But I actually wanted to to really make this this point clear. There is no one way to do science, Dave. Like you asked me in the beginning about science, there is no science says or follow the science. There's not even science. Like science uh, is essentially basically a, a you know a shortcut, a hack for us unraveling fundamental truths that never is perfect, is guaranteed to be imperfect. <laughs> Sheldon Glashow, the nucleator. Shelley or Sheldon Glashow. So he's the namesake inspiration for the Big Bang uh, theories. Uh, Sheldon, mm -hmm. young Sheldon. Sheldon. Um, he's a throwback to he's an older guy. And, and he really, you know, made his way doing something quite unique. My wife told me last night she was reading it. And yeah, I wrote another book before this. I'm not convinced she read that book, Dave. Don't, don't tell her I said so. Although she's a big, big fan of yours. So she, she'll she be disappointed to, to know if you read that first book and not this. Anyway, so she was reading last. She's like, this is so appropriate because what he discovered, like um, the discovery that electricity and magnetism in technical physics terms are basically two different aspects of one underlying physical law. And that's called electromagnetism. So that you can turn a small current, can move a motor and spin a motor. You could also spin that motor and generate a current. That's in fact how currents and electrical power generation works. Um, so he discovered the analog of that unification in what's called the nuclear force. It's not super important to get into, but it really delineated how these things that we perceive very different, a magnet that you put in your refrigerator and uh, you know, and a nine volt battery, they seem very different, but they are different manifestations of the same underlying coin. He did so with his colleagues, uh, Steven Weinberg and Amdas Salam in the uh, 60s and 70s, they discovered a similar feature of uh, the nuclear force. And my wife was reading, she's like, this is so interesting because what one person perceives as a manifestation, say pure electricity, another will perceive as magnetism hmm. or as one person sees as electricity, we'll see as a nuclear force. That's so interesting. Cause could, could you imagine Dave, as you do often, and you talk about in your book, can you argue the other person's side? Can you do that? Because otherwise, as you said, I might like debate is kind of pointless. Like, you're, oh, Joe Biden did a great, you know, debating with Trump. I'm going to vote for him now as a diehard. No, that never happened. <laughs> but if you can say, I see your perspective, right? And literally, it is just as kosher, just as good as another person's perspective. Well, then why not use that as a metaphor for how we could be maybe a little less polarized? So I like that she got. I wasn't intending to say that, um, but but it did come out and in, uh, from her interpretation of reading this chapter about how things that appear so different, Dave, are really the same. Matter manifestation of, of, of the underlying same phenomenon. We actually could use a little bit more of that in politics. I'm sure I could use a little bit more of it personally as well. Uh, <laughs> then, then there's an interstitial. Should we go into the interstitial? Why do you throw an interstitial into the book? Do yeah, people well, have to get know, up and pee? To... What's going on here? I got paid by the word. No, uh, it's a short book, you know, and it's it's not. There's no physics equations. There's no homework, uh, you know. Although you, you know, you being a master of quantum electrodynamics would have done quite well if there were. Naturally, I had uh, uh, custom illustrations, and I should say I have a podcast where I give away all these interviews. You don't have to buy them. I hope you will. I hope you'll get the audio or the or the uh, printed book. But, um, but I actually wanted to to really make this this point clear. There is no one way to do science, Dave. Like you asked me in the beginning about science. There is no science says or follow the science. There's not even science. Like science uh, is essentially basically a, a, you know, a shortcut, a hack for us unraveling fundamental truths that never is perfect, is guaranteed to be imperfect. And so to some of us gives great comfort because you can never get the right answer. In other words, Newton was darn smart and he is responsible for the laws that take Elon Musk, SpaceX mm -hmm. to the to the stars and took the Apollo astronauts to the surface of the moon. Um, but if you want to go and understand the properties of a black hole, his work will not do and you need Einstein. Well, guess what? Einstein's not the right answer either. We're going to find some subsequent improvement to it, maybe quantum gravity, which we'll, you know, we'll get it. We have a 10 part learning company series, you and I on that. So we can refer <laughs> people to that lecture series. But that's yes, called quantum yes, gravity. That's, and guess what? That won't be the final answer either. So I want to show that there's different approaches to arriving at truth. You can manifest them. I was talking to uh, Tom Bilyeu, who lives in uh, LA, is a famous mm -hmm. podcaster. Mm -hmm. Great guy. Had him on the show. I was actually at his laboratory. And he told me his way that he works through, you know, when he was at Quest Nutrition and he was developing these really tasty but nutritious bars, protein bars, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the scientific method that he was using 
and how he also applies it to venture capital or to now he's into NFTs and Bitcoin and stuff like that. But it's a it's a process of thinking guaranteed to be imperfect, but better than all the rest. So I want to outline how you can do it. My avatar is a is a car salesman in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, it's not a scientist. It's not written for science science majors. And that you can apply methodological thinking, testing hypotheses, listening to your critics, uh, uh, achieving consensus, and realizing in surreptitiously perhaps that when you hear things like ninety nine percent of scientists agree, you should be very concerned. We you hear, should be very concerned. We hear an awful lot about that these days uh, on many fronts, actually, not just COVID, climate change, all sorts of things. Uh, Carl Wyman, the teacher's teacher. Yeah, so for a long time, I had been kind of an acolyte of Malcolm Gladwell, uh, who you know popularized. He didn't invent this this uh, this this concept, but the so-called ten thousand hour rule. So I did a little math. You've been doing podcasting, uh, the Rubin Report. Been on you know two thousands early two thousands. You've had way more than ten thousand hours. But the study that Gladwell and uh, and Anders Ericsson popularized was that basically the best pilots have ten thousand hours of flight experience. Bill Gates had like 10,000 hours of computer programming by the time Microsoft. Steve Jobs had 10,000 hours. Yeah. So he done, it's basically, it's not a scientific analysis. Mm -hmm. It's really co uh, correlative. Um, and I wanted to know, well, we as professors, we never really get taught how to teach. It's very rare. You may be interested in teaching and pedagogy, but we have so many other obligations in addition to teaching, research, funding, uh, bureaucracy, you know, and, and getting through, you know, all the different hoops of working, not just at a state university, any university. Um, and then teaching is on there and it, it's a big priority. It's the reason we get into it. But oftentimes we're, we're distracted by other quotidian demands. And in this case, I wanted to kind of demystify, how should we be teaching? Because I don't know if you know it, but the way that we teach with like some dude scraping a piece of rock on another piece of rock, that is almost exactly a thousand year old model. It's not been disrupted since the year 1080 in Bologna, Italy, when the first modern university incarnation came along, where you'd have some guy, you know, and, but the only thing that's better now is that back then, Dave, the students could go on strike and the professors would not get paid. So thank God we have tenure. I mean, that, you know, that's barbaric. That is a barbaric practice. But other than that, what has changed? So I got into all sorts of things. Could we have an artificial intelligent professor? Could we alleviate some of the, the burden, but also free up the, the, the minds and the time of the student to do it? And he likened our current practice of teaching to the medical practices of the 18th and 17th century with leeches and bloodletting. <laughs> he said, we're at a primitive state and we need to go beyond that. He has some models to do it. I don't think any of them are foolproof, but the key takeaway I took, Dave, is that to be a good teacher, you have to be a student of teaching. And, and I pointed out in the book uh, that the word scientist in the Russian language means someone who was taught. To me, that conveys an obligation. You both have to be a good student, but you have to be a good teacher to pay it forward to the next generation. And so I think he exemplifies that to me and really made me want to double down and be a better teacher uh, by studying teaching. And that's not something I really have that much time to do, but I find a little bit of effort goes a long way with it. And I hope in anybody's field, the way to learn something, to be a better salesman, to be a better podcaster. I think I asked you when you came out, I was like, how do you know, Dave, when you're giving a good interview, when you're doing a good in job as an interview? Like there's no, like you don't have a grader anymore, but you must study it and you must listen to it. And even if that means studying with people that maybe you don't agree with all the time, um, you can learn a lot. And that's part of the humble uh, you know, nature that I think it takes to be a good student and ergo a good teacher. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about academia instead of nonstop yelling, check out our academia playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, check out our full episode playlist. They're all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.